This is the true story of a counterintelligence operation to propagate a modern myth. This is the disturbing true story of the aviary. The subject of ufology is a convoluted, densely packed topic with multiple subjects all vying for their own peculiar brand of attention. It becomes almost impossible to penetrate and discern any semblance of reality from this subject. And this, as it turns out, is entirely the point. Unless you know exactly what to look for. To try and make sense of historical UFO stories, testimony, blurry videos, and a distinct lack of any viable public evidence for the existence of alien life visiting our planet, despite an abundance of extraordinary unsubstantiated claims, then we need to delve into the history of UFOs and see if the echoes of the past are informing our present. Let's not begin with Roswell or Project Blue Book or even Kenneth Arnold, but where officialdom first systematically began covertly and overtly infiltrating the UFO community, which to this day leaves an undeniable cultural legacy of deceit and fraud. Let's begin with the counterintelligence operation that would lead to the complete mental and physical breakdown of a man who would ultimately take his own life because of the information the United States government were providing to him. Let's begin with Paul Benowitz. The story of Paul Benowitz is the origin of modern ufology and the key to understanding what is transpiring today, only on a much grander public scale. It began with audio engineer and electronic expert Paul Benowitz in the late 1970s, who lived in the shadow of Kirkland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Paul intercepted an odd signal emanating from the base and decided to confront Kirkland's military officials with his unusual data. This unlocked a sequence of events that would ultimately lead to Paul's demise. What began as a novel approach by the OSI unit located at Kirkland, which had recently been established in 1979, would become a legacy of tactical deceit. Paul Benowitz, amongst others, would be used as a means of sowing disinformation directly into the UFO community and UFOs would be used as a cover for the aerospace industry, with the seemingly elusive stamp of officialdom convincing generations of a convenient lie by interweaving themselves directly into UFO law. The hands have very oval shaped eyes, a very narrow nose, a slit for about slits for years, no hair on the head, kind of a bulb shaped head. It wouldn't require much effort because as most people come to understand through their own experience, governments lie all the time for reasons that may never be officially revealed. And even if they are, the people involved in those operations are always long since gone and accountability is no longer possible. See the Tuskegee experiments, MKUltra, radiation experimentation on unwitting soldiers, Agent Orange, the Gulf of Tonkin, the list is endless so it should come as no surprise people generally share a mistrust of their government, because some conspiracies are genuinely real. 
The term conspiracy theorist was first coined by CIA operatives as a means of discrediting people involved in the public inquiry into JFK's assassination. Enter Richard Doty. The OSI operative charged with convincing Paul Benowitz that the signals that he had intercepted emanating from Kirkland were actually communications from aliens who were secretly working with government officials at the base. Doty would go on to provide an active member in the UFO community named Bill Moore, himself an avid ufologist and the co-author of the first book on Roswell, called The Roswell Incident. Bill Moore is also believed to have assisted in the breaking and entering of Paul's home. Richard Doty tasked Bill Moore with providing information to Paul Benowitz, and would later publicly admit to a stunned audience at MUFON of his involvement in a coordinated psychological campaign against him. To the best of my knowledge, it was all disinformation, and I was the unfortunate one who had unwittingly supplied the fuel to those who were spreading the fire. I've held my silence on this matter for more than six years. Now you know the truth. Disinformation, disinformation is a strange and bizarre game. Those who play it are completely aware that an operation's success is dependent upon dropping information upon a target or mark in such a way that the person will accept it as truth and will repeat and even defend it to others as if it were true. Once this has been accomplished, we certainly have a number of rude people in this audience. That's too bad. Once this has been accomplished, the work of the counterintelligence specialist is complete. They can simply withdraw in the confidence that the dirty work of spreading their poison seeds will be done by others. Those who want proof of how well the process works need only look around you. Every time one of you repeats an unverified or unsubstantiated bit of information without qualifying it as such. You are contributing to that process. And every time you do it, somebody in a need-to-know position sits back and has a horse laugh at your expense. Frankly, I'm a little ashamed of some people in this audience, regardless of what you believe, what you hear, or not. Needless to say, this was the immediate end of Bill Moore's career. It turned out that what disturbed officials at Kirkland wasn't that Paul Benowitz had uncovered a clandestine operation between humanity and an outside alien force, but the signals that Paul Benowitz had intercepted were actually part of a highly sensitive project being conducted at Kirkland at the time and this information was just too sensitive to be out in the open. Effectively, Paul Benowitz was conducting an espionage campaign and spying on a government facility with advanced audio radio equipment that he had access to. During this period, Paul Benowitz was monitored, provided with fraudulent documentation on Majestic 12, his computer was replaced by the government and would spit out literal gibberish that he was told were secret readouts of distant communication between aliens and Kirkland Air Force Base. And he was even flown in a private plane in the middle of nowhere in Dulce, New Mexico, where he was informed an alien base was operating, complete with carefully laid props on the ground that he was encouraged to take pictures of as they flew over. In fact, every story you have ever heard about Dulce underground alien bases and exchange programs between humanity and aliens is directly derived from the psychological campaign conducted against Paul Benowitz. Paul's mind began to unravel. He became noticeably paranoid and reclusive. He believed everything that was being fed to him. And why wouldn't he? He now believed that he was being brought into the fold of a secret operation an operation which involved what may be the precursor to a full-scale alien invasion. And all of this information was coming directly, albeit covertly, from officials at Kirkland Air Force Base. 
Little did Paul Benowitz know that what he was being brought into was indeed a real covert operation, but that the operation revolved directly around him. What was actually transpiring was a systematic campaign to disinform, disarm, and to maintain control of the sensitive signal data that he had uncovered. His willingness to believe in the extraordinary was directly exploited and used against him. Paul Benowitz would eventually commit suicide living in a concocted fantasy world that he was systematically convinced to pursue, using cruel lies and operational tradecraft by an uncaring government eager to keep their tactical advantage over the Soviet Union during the Cold War. <laughs> This is the legacy of modern ufology, and the same people responsible for it are mingling throughout the UFO community to this day, spinning the same tired stories to convince new generations of the validity of the US government's involvement with alien technology. The problem with the truth is that some people lie for reasons which make no rational sense, even in the minds of those telling their lies. And this, unfortunately, is a fact. Ask any police officer who has had to deal with deceptive people every day. They'd be happy to inform you just how deceitful people can be, especially if it garners them attention, an escape from mundane reality and the ability to be accepted by people willing to believe their deceit. Wanting to believe a subject doesn't necessarily mean that you should. People who wrap themselves up in the subject matter form their identities in it and feel validated by those genuinely seeking answers to questions we all have. Are we really alone? Now for a historical deception of counterintelligence operatives into this mix and the current ability to become a celebrity in your own cultural group by parroting repetitive stories which just so happen to be highly lucrative due to the widespread appeal of those interested in the possibility of alien contact. Many ufologists dedicate their lives to this subject, portray themselves as secretive insiders, routinely withhold information, and form their own social cliques, which ironically operate much like a shadowy cabal, and they actively mingle with the very counterintelligence operatives exploiting their beliefs, which goes hand in hand with earning money directly out of you. It's not easy to admit to yourself, never mind others, that you have been duped. And if you spend a lifetime falling down a rabbit hole leading nowhere, even if you realize it, the odds are you wouldn't leave it, because your life has become so intimately entwined in it that it doesn't pay to confront reality. Instead, it's easier to viciously attack those who point out the irrationality, and then offer up those dissenters as proof of a conspiracy against them, while simultaneously profiting from it. If you have spent any time in the UFO community, you will know this to be especially true, because you see it all the time. Nobody ever wants to be talked down to, and that is certainly not my intention. Think about how you personally got interested in UFOs. Did you see something in the sky you couldn't explain? Read a book or watch a documentary that fascinated you? Or was it some sort of personal trauma and a willingness to accept a more interesting reality? in place of the cruel reality which we are all forced to live in. Either way, it's entirely human to question and to search for patterns in the chaos. People usually take interest in the subject of UFOs at an early age. Minds are lit on fire by outlandish books and documentaries offering extraordinary claims, but never any actual evidence. And that's the key. The evidence just isn't there. And it never was, despite claims, countless books, documentaries and podcasts. Today, we are exactly where ufology was in 1947. Nowhere. Albeit with far more stories, more sensationalism, and an increasing presence by those with official agendas to either exploit beliefs for tactical advantage 
or for profiteers to generate revenue out of you. So let's now look at how the history of counterintelligence operations in ufology play into the modern UFO landscape. We'll begin with the origin of the aviary. The use of UFO believers proliferating disinformation did not begin with Bill Moore or Paul Benowitz. It really began a few years earlier in the mid-1970s during the mainstream re-emergence of science fiction, when the topic of aliens once again impacted popular culture after the heyday of the 1950s, with the likes of the Roswell conspiracy re-emerging into public light after Stanton Friedman was advised by a producer on a local radio show to look into the story. Betty and Barney Hill, and of course Star Wars Alien and Close Encounters of the Third Kind became smash hits at the worldwide box office. Meanwhile, cattle mutilations and alien abductions became popular new additions to UFO mythology. It was during this time official interest in convincing the public in the validity of UFOs truly began, and it begins with a documentary titled UFOs Past, Present and Future, later retitled and re-edited as UFOs It Has Begun a documentary utilizing the first official collaborative involvement of the United States government. The first and only time it ever happened. A documentary the CIA was systematically involved in having produced, with literal spooks used as go-betweens for the producers and officials providing the testimony and visual evidence. Snippets of indistinct grainy UFO footage would be provided to the production from official sources unsubstantiated claims of a UFO landing at Holloman Air Force Base would be made, reams of footage of which was promised but never actually materialized. More on that later, and testimony would help fill in the considerable voids in the stories. Is any of this starting to sound familiar? It should, because it's exactly the same counterintelligence playbook in operation today. But what makes this particular documentary so fascinating and a cornerstone in UFO law is it helps to unravel the actual mystery and the methodology behind those pushing the narrative. Not because of what it contains, the information provided is practically useless, but how counterintelligence agents went about manipulating the production of the documentary. And the deceptive playbook that quickly followed in its wake is more disturbing than any concocted alien narrative. Culminating in a shadowy group coining themselves the aviary, that systematically infiltrated and deceived the entire UFO community. And it still operates to this day, albeit in a far more effective and manipulative mainstream form. Our group is euphemistically called the aviary, and each individual uses the code name of a bird as an identifier. We will continue to provide the UFO community with data and we will continue to proceed in a way which we feel best suits our purposes. In 1973, Robert Emmenegger and Alan Sandler, two well-connected LA TV producers of documentaries, music videos and ads with extensive connections to intelligence agencies, were invited to Norton Air Force Base in California to discuss proposals for a feature film documentary on a number of subjects proposed by the military. One proposal was on advanced military projects in neural control being developed by the Air Force. The other was on UFOs, a subject which neither of them had any interest in, but the Air Force claimed to be interested in freely cooperating and sharing information on the subject for the first and only time in its long, deeply checkered history. But what really sealed the deal and got production cameras rolling was the insistence that they were in the possession of over 14,000 feet of extraordinary footage taken from multiple vantage points of a UFO landing in May of 1971. What if I told you that a UFO landed at Holloman Air Force Base and it was all caught on film? Production began in earnest. Sandler and Emmenegger would travel to Holloman Air Force Base, speak with officials and freely walked amongst the base speaking with its inhabitants seeking corroboration of something inexplicable having happened a few years previous, with flippant remarks confirming a glowing object seemingly having landed on one of the base's runways. During this time, Paul Shartle, the military liaison between producers and officials, started providing footage, official witnesses, testimony from Air Force personnel, 
all of which was unimpressive and inconsequential, and entirely unrelated to the supposed Holloman Air Force Base UFO landing. As production progressed on the documentary, Emenegger and Sandler kept pressing the Holloman footage with Shartle, but after multiple assurances and back and forths, it still hadn't materialised, much to their continued frustration. To help make a bit more sense of this, let's move a little further ahead in time to October the 15th, 1988. Next, two people who have survived a close encounter with a UFO but suffered dire consequences. Stay with us. Paul Shartle, the intelligence liaison for UFOs past, present and future, would later appear in a live 1988 broadcast, imaginatively titled UFO Cover-Up Live, an entirely scripted and awkward event in a long since forgotten live TV broadcast that was once again used to dangle the elusive carrot that was the Holloman Air Force Base UFO landing footage and bring together a whole slew of notable characters from throughout the UFO community, as well as what this broadcast was really intended for, counterintelligence operatives who would use this much publicized platform to enact the first public trial of their psychological operation on viewers at home. What followed was a mixture of true believers and UFO researchers mingled with shrewd calculating counterintelligence agents. And in certain cases, those working both sides, like Bill Moore, who was also present alongside Stanton Friedman to discuss the Roswell case. Paul Shartle would also appear in this broadcast alongside Robert Emenegger, claiming that he'd seen 16 mm footage of the Holloman UFO landing incident in 1971. I saw footage of three disc-shaped crafts. One of the craft landed and two of them went away. Why did it land? It appeared to be in trouble because it oscillated all the way down to the ground. However, it did land on three pods. This live broadcast is both notable and notorious due to it involving members of the intelligence world, all of which was supposedly coming forward for the first time to publicly discuss their knowledge of UFOs. In anonymous silhouette, of course. I dug up this rare live recording in its entirety. And while the broadcast was indeed live, let's remember, the entire event had been pre-scripted and all of the guests featured were told to stick directly to that script, to the distaste of some participants. The craft that was observed was a alien craft piloted by military. Video segments were used to portray the mysterious aviary whistleblowers, like Falcon, and Condor, both secretly OSI agents mingling in the UFO community and spreading disinformation. Let's take a look. Uh, Bill, tell us how you first got involved. I got a phone call after appearing on a radio show from a man who said, you're the only person we've heard talk about this subject who seems to know what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. He convinced me that he was a government intelligence agent and wanted to begin disseminating some information about UFOs to the public. And the man Bill is referring to is Falcon, whom we've seen in shadow to protect his identity. That's right. J-12 functions as a policy-making group relating to extraterrestrial activities and contacts and UFO activities within the United States. They make the policy, obtain presidential approval, and then field activities implement the policies. This was the first time that the aviary had made its public debut, and Richard Doty was one of the aviary members in the shadows amongst this live broadcast, going under the pseudonym Falcon. Hal Putoff, I'm a physicist. Uh, I'm also director of the Institute for Advanced Studies at Austin. Hal Putoff, another elusive aviary member believed to be OWL, and also indisputably associated with the CIA, who has been intimately involved for decades in pushing the UFO narrative, amongst others, who joined Tom DeLonge's To The Stars Academy, a UFO entertainment investor scam, where extraordinary promises were made to investors who they were seeking funding from to actively develop and build real anti-gravity UFOs. And build an exotic craft with an energy source that can revolutionize the world. Look very closely at these people and who they are and take notice of where they come from 
and think about the realities of what this team has the ability to accomplish and deliver if we're fully equipped. Obviously, no UFOs were ever built. This was also done alongside counterintelligence agent Lou Elizondo, who had recently left the government and moved straight into an investor scam. Literally finished his career at the Department of Defense as senior intelligence officer in the uh, office of the Secretary of Defense days ago, and now he is on the stage with us. Who also claimed to be the head of an official UFO program at the Pentagon that turned out to never have had any official duties with the Pentagon and UFOs at all. Al Putoff is also involved in many anti-gravity investor schemes over the years on behalf of the CIA, Joe Fermiage being one, and remains alongside with Doty one of the central advocates of UFO counterintelligence misinformation. Many active counterintelligence agents currently operating today were actively involved in the 1988 UFO cover-up live broadcast in one capacity or another, albeit acting under pseudonyms and standing back in the shadows. Aviary members would each refer to themselves after specific types of birds as they trawled early UFO community message boards claiming extraordinary things while taking part in shock TV documentaries, becoming covert sources for books, and generally hijacking the UFO community to sow their own brand of strategic disinformation. Pseudonyms include the likes of Falcon, Eagle, Owl, Sparrow, Blue Jay, Seagull, Hawk, Condor, Raven, Pelican, and even Penguin. This went on for years, and as you'll soon come to learn, it never stopped. I was out on the West Coast and reviewing things with my old partner, and uh, we, we, he was much more open about allowing whoever to know a little bit behind the scenes that's really what happened and I I surmi surmised it myself but uh, you know I kept saying it wasn't the Air Force and actually it, it was instigated by our friends with the three initials hmm CIA mm -hmm. and they were oh. they were see they were involved all along and I just uh, should have put two and two and three together to come up with it but because I remember meeting them, they were all always over, and then we helped them with other projects. Once production on UFOs past, present and future neared conclusion, Robert Emenegger and Alan Sandler allegedly continued pressing Paul Shartle to provide the Holloman footage that they were promised. And it got to such a point during production where there was nothing else that could be shot, as everything else that could have been covered was. So, without the Holloman footage, and with plans still in motion for it to be provided, they decided to begin tackling the penultimate segment of the documentary by returning back to Holloman Air Force Base and shooting insert shots of the base itself. The control tower, radars, fire engines scrambling on a runway, jets taking off, and a helicopter hovering above Holloman's airfield, so the sequence could be cut together later in post using dramatic reenactments that would be spliced together with the footage of the actual event, once the Holloman footage was provided. But as you might expect, it never was. At least, not much of it. But we'll get to that in a moment. The documentary was now complete, but the Holloman sequence was not. It was at this point that allegedly, the Air Force began mysteriously requesting back all of the footage that had been provided, most of it being utterly inconsequential. And with that, cooperation with the official United States military sources all but ceased. The decision was then made that the sequence should be re-edited into a hypothetical scenario, which may have already happened, and in place of the actual footage, they would simply use cheap pastel drawings. The documentary was released to little fanfare and was quickly all but forgotten until it was later re-edited for TV in the 1980s and titled UFOs It Has Begun, narrated and presented by Rod Serling. As the years passed, rumors continued to swirl of other UFO researchers being promised this mythical Holloman UFO footage, 
Linda Moulton Howe, a former reporter and famous UFO investigator, responsible for bringing to popular attention cattle mutilations with a tendency for bending truth and disseminating outright UFO hoaxes, claimed that she was offered the same footage in the late 1980s that once again never materialized from officials. And it was Richard Doty amongst a few others at Kirtland who were also responsible for this. The Holloman footage became a perpetual dangling carrot for many UFO researchers, suckered into the vicinity of officials with narratives to push. And it worked. The myth was born, took on a life entirely of its own, with people taking elements of this story and bending it to their own means. Decades later, in 2013, Robert Emenegger would re-emerge and tell his story, alongside a newly reformed Richard Doty in the 2013 documentary Mirage Men. Doty by this point had rebranded himself as a private citizen, fighting for UFO truth, lamenting his sinister past and diminishing his role in driving Paul Benowitz to an early grave. Only now, in the interim between 1979 and 2013, Richard Doty had almost single-handedly become responsible for creating much of the UFO mythology between then and 2013. And by this point, was speaking at UFO conventions, on podcasts, and in TV shows spinning entirely new concocted fantasies, mingling the mundane truth with extraordinary fiction, which as any counterintelligence operative would tell you, is exactly how the lies are made plausible. If you've ever heard of Project Serpo, the alleged exchange between humans and extraterrestrials, which is eerily similar to Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters, well, that was Richard Doty too. Moonlighting under different pseudonyms, all working towards the same goal, to create an incredible story. Robert Emenegger now amended his story too, seemingly confirming rumours that have been whispered about for decades that they actually did receive footage of the Holloman incident, and that nine seconds of this footage was covertly edited into the Holloman sequence in the documentary Past, Present and Future. And here it is. This footage has been debated for years, and the history and baggage surrounding it makes it far more compelling than anything else in the documentary. And at face value, it does seem odd. The craft appears to be glowing, and, just as Paul Shartle said, it appears to be oscillating. Let's see what Paul Shartle said about the Holloman footage that he allegedly saw, in its entirety, on UFO cover-up live. I saw footage of three disc-shaped crafts. One of the craft landed and two of them went away. Why did it land? It appeared to be in trouble because it oscillated all the way down to the ground. However, it did land on three pods. A sliding door opened, a ramp was extended, and out came three aliens. <laughs> what, what did they look like? Well, they were human-sized. They had odd gray complexion and a pronounced nose. They wore tight-fitting jumpsuits, thin headdresses that appeared to be communication devices, and their hands, in their hands, they held a translator, I was told. Yeah. A Holloman base commander and other Air Force officers went out to meet them. Now, you actually saw these aliens on the film? Yes. This film footage sounded very, very special, and we wanted to use it as the ending of our television special. And did you? Was it in your special? Well, although the Pentagon had been very, very cooperative all the way, at the last minute, the film was confiscated and we lost the whole finale of our show. But what I saw and heard was enough to convince me that, you know, the phenomenon of UFOs is real, very real. So is it actually classified footage of a UFO shot at Holloman Air Force Base in 1971? No. It's not classified footage, but it was shot at Holloman. It's actually an insert shot taken during the production of the documentary of a plane, an F-4 Phantom to be exact, coming in for a landing with its high beam on. And this is indisputable. I need to stop for a second and explain something. I've been working on various aspects of this film and other productions for a long time, and I have been closely following the Holloman UFO case since before this millennium began, primarily due to the fascinating story with this footage. I always suspected it was not what was being presented, and went to great lengths to obtain information on it, speaking with radio show hosts who had the opportunity of speaking with Robert Emenegger, and speaking briefly with Robert Emenegger himself over a decade ago. This is a long story, and I may expand upon it one day. I indeed discovered that this footage was a lie, much in the same manner of how another filmmaker did, and this is what I need to address. 
on the 22nd of May 2023, a YouTube user here suddenly released a video that absolutely crushed me, because it systematically laid out what I already knew, that the Holloman footage was a lie, and that the reprinting of UFOs past, present and future that was remastered from an original negative, and in this particular scan, that shot is revealed to be nothing more than a plane, and I kept this to myself, quietly working away for a long time, hoping to be able to present it when life permitted. But in a cruel twist of fate, it just wasn't meant to be. And here suddenly, a truly apt name deserves all the credit for being diligent and prompt in his presentation. I licked my wounds and quietly subscribed to him. Good work. The carefully constructed story of the Holloman UFO landing was an elaborate lie. And if this footage was a lie, then the people telling us that it was genuine footage coming from the government are also lying. And not only that, but so too are those who made the documentary and also made these claims. It's too bad we couldn't get that footage from the Air Force. The entire Holloman case is built on a lie, constructed entirely by people either directly involved with or closely associated with intelligence agencies. But this isn't entirely the end of the Holloman UFO landing story. There is another aspect to this story that isn't well known, regarding a Polaroid taken during a private screening of the Holloman footage in the late 1970s, which has been allegedly shown to a number of people interested in this case over the years. And this was even alluded to by Robert Emenegger in the finale of the documentary Mirage Men. It was a daylight shot of a light ascending on Holloman Air Force Base. And then with that little clip, that's all that I can tell you that was genuine. A landing of a craft at Holloman, it was film, very brief. That's all, you know, I can tell you it's genuine. And um, just to say on camera, you never saw the Holloman landing footage yourself? Not really. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, can you elaborate? Uh, Can we just wait for the car? Saved by the car. I'm, I'm trying to think how to answer that. I knew what the film was about, what it, uh, all the details of it, but I never saw a real projected version. You saw a still of it? Yes. One day this image may actually materialize, but if it ever does, you can be assured that it will not be what it appears to be, because the entire Holloman story, while fascinating, is entirely fabricated. Not to mention every other expanded aspect of Holloman's involvement in UFO mythology. The Holloman UFO landing case is case closed, and every other story associated with it is also contaminated. In order for the Holloman tale to have flourished inside the minds of UFO believers, it required being a fantastic tale of intrigue and covert footage that accompanied the production. What was actually presented became second fiddle to what may have been, or perhaps one day could be, and this is the same playbook in operation today. Tell an extraordinary story, provide innocuous evidence to support it, use counterintelligence operatives as disclosure whistleblowers, and let people's minds do the rest of the heavy lifting, filling in the voids of the narrative with endless possibility then once people become restless of multiple assurances of UFO disclosure, shift the goalposts and declare it a cover-up, lending further credence to the baseless claims. Meanwhile, everybody who's feeding from the subject profits from it every step of the way. Time after time, this is exactly how it's done. In the late 1980s, around the same time as UFO cover-up live, a man named Bob Lazar was quietly being courted by John Lear, the son of the man who invented the Lear jet, along with modern UFO guru and exaggerated storyteller George Knapp. Lear Knapp and Lazar would later take drunken excursions out to the perimeter of Groom Lake, where Lazar would show them operational test flights of supposed UFOs that he claimed to be working on in a secret reverse engineering program at a secret location known as S4, at Area 51. 
but it wouldn't take long for Lazar's story to take an Avery-like plot twist. He mysteriously decided to deploy the very same methods used by the aviary to disclose his supposed knowledge. In an exclusive TV interview for local Las Vegas news with George Knapp, Bob Lazar appeared in silhouette to discuss his alleged story. Only now he was supposedly frightened for his life and going public to protect himself. He then proceeded to profit directly from it alongside George Knapp, selling expensive videos to a niche market of devout believers and making numerous documentary appearances. For a man who claims to want to shun the limelight, his history reveals a man who is anything but shy of attention. He flew a pirate flag over his home, made a car with a rudimentary rocket engine that he routinely demonstrated in his neighborhood. All of this came long before his reverse engineering UFO tales. His education is spotty at best. Despite the repeated claims, his story has significantly altered over the years. He is most assuredly an attention seeker, but avoids any and all public debate because his story simply cannot hold up to even mild scrutiny. The fact that he cannot validate the academics responsible for his supposed education at MIT is an issue. The year, what was the year of graduation? Probably. Probably 82, because I think I left there. Went to Los Alamos? I went to Los Alamos. Oh, Is there something? Uh, you say your records at Caltech and MIT have somehow disappeared? In Los Alamos and probably everywhere else. Is there any way you can you could re reconstruct uh, your coursework and your professors? Oh, sure. I've got people that, uh, you know, that I went to school with, and you know, George has spoke, George Knapp has spoken to some of them, and you know, even flew with me up to Los Alamos and spoke to my colleagues there, and uh, you know, it's just. Could you could you reveal some of your professors at MIT and Caltech? Yeah, if you want. I don't have a list of them here. Dr. Duxler, I think, was one of them, and uh, uh, Hostfield was another. Hostfield. Hostfield. H-O-H-S-F-I-E-L-D or something along those lines. They remember you? Oh yeah, Hostfield I know well. These are at MIT or Caltech? Uh, Hostfield was at uh, MIT. The fact that he has been caught lying and taking entire swathes of his story wholesale from popular works of fiction like Close Encounters, scientific magazines, and even Billy Meyer, one of the most notorious UFO hoaxes in the history of the subject, does not lend any authenticity to his story. The saucer shape that has this a three, is a, three this saucer. is the one that uh, looks like a my one of the Meyer craft. Right. right. Have you ever seen the Billy Meyer? Does it look similar to that? the Billy Meyer movies? I don't think I've ever seen any motion. Yeah, he's got some that fly around a tree, and they've got. Some oh wait, I did see that. Yeah, I did see that. And then there's some other hovering ones where they wobble. You know what's strange about the Billy Meyer photographs that the the discs that one of the ones he took a picture of looks exactly like the one that I looked on. As for the elusive Element 115, which he claimed to have stolen from Area 51 and secreted away with the help of George Knapp for protection, well, that element was already much hypothesized and discussed as early as the 1960s and as close to a few weeks as before Bob Lazar went public in Scientific American. Despite this, it is a story that has become as popular as ever, primarily due to George Knapp, with the help of another individual named Jeremy Corbell, who is now publicly disseminating misrepresented classified material, once again coming from official sources. And for as unimpressive as all of the George Knapp and Corbell leaks are, they are genuinely classified leaks. And that being the case, it's illegal. Anyone doing that without the consent of the government should be in jail. Either way, whether overtly, which I suspect in Knapp's case, or unwittingly, as I suspect in Corbell's case, something is wrong with both Corbell and Knapp. And the profit being made as a direct result of the literal propaganda they are proliferating with what appears to be a green light from officials unconcerned with somebody disseminating classified Reaper drone screenshots and video shot on Navy vessels of adversarial drones doing distinctly unremarkable things. And in some cases, just misrepresenting blurry stars in the sky, obscured by bokeh, which are an artifact of the camera's aperture. 
To then claim that these objects are breaking the laws of physics, but which no physicist has ever confirmed to be the case, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to understand that things are not what they seem to be, especially when Jeremy Corbell, George Knapp and Bob Lazar go out of their way to avoid public debate where they would be expected to answer difficult questions that they are fully aware cannot be answered if the story is to persist. See Eric Weinstein's recent proposal for Bob Lazar to sit down and discuss his supposed knowledge of theoretical physics with an actual academic. Wow, yeah, that kind of, let that sink in a second. Yeah. Corbell, Knapp and Lazar himself have heavily profited from UFO documentaries, podcasts, t-shirts, convention appearances, even UFO model kits. They routinely lie by omission, bend any truth worth bending, and ignore vital context to sensationalize their profitable tales. They claim to seek truth, but if you try to sit them down in a room with an actual academic on what is currently the single most popular show on Earth, at the request of Joe Rogan himself, then their MO changes from publicly commenting on any and all UFO-related topics in virtual real-time to mysteriously vanishing from the public sphere altogether. Until the coast is clear, then they re-emerge with even more stories, perhaps another classified leak or a misrepresented balloon, missile flying over a war zone in Iraq, or flares dropped over a military base in California. You get the point. Something is wrong. And if you're unable to recognize it, it's not because you're stupid, it's probably because you have no knowledge of the deceptive history of this subject. Good afternoon. A photo has surfaced that a lot of people are claiming is proof that the Roswell UFO incident was real. It's a picture of an alien type creature and they claim it was taken in 1947 in Roswell. Richard Dolan, a man who promotes himself as the bastion of respectable so-called ufology, but in reality has made it his livelihood and ensnared himself in profitable hoaxes, like Jamie Masson's infamous Roswell Slides event, which turned out to be nothing more than a museum exhibit. Richard Dolan also publicly claimed that he knew what was in the classified UFO briefings, but once that information was released, it turned out that the information he was providing wasn't accurate at all. Time after time, we see people portray themselves as knowledgeable insiders, but it always turns out that their actual knowledge leaves much to be desired. Stephen Greer, a man who brought together a number of UFO officials from all walks of life discussing their encounters with UFOs in the Disclosure Project, but in reality, a literal huckster, responsible for disseminating hoax documentation, courting officials with lies, claiming to have debriefed every president and CIA director in the last 20 plus years on the topic of UFOs, with no records or evidence of any of these alleged briefings ever having taken place, who has also attached himself to numerous profitable hoaxes, boldly proclaiming to have the body of an extraterrestrial and promoted as such to sell his awful documentary Sirius which was later proven to be a mummified ancient fetus, who also operates an ongoing business involving private alien contact, where people pay thousands of dollars to go out into the desert or stand on a secluded beach and meditate as someone drops flares out of a private plane on the horizon. Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man on the moon, was undoubtedly courted by counterintelligence agents on the UFO topic and died a believer due to what he was being told behind the scenes. It turns out by dubious people who have almost certainly already been referenced or soon will be in this very video. The now infamous Admiral Wilson document came from Edgar Mitchell's estate after his death, touted as the UFO leak of the century by Richard Dolan, but refuted adamantly by Admiral Wilson himself as complete lies both publicly and to Richard Dolan personally. The Admiral Wilson memo is almost certainly fanciful fiction, tailored to suit the whims of a billionaire being exploited for money and his belief in the subject. And that document's author is none other than Eric Davis, another dubious so-called academic with kooky fringe theories employed at the time by Robert Bigelow to look into UFOs on his behalf. Robert Bigelow, a billionaire who was initially conned into purchasing Skinwalker Ranch and initiating the NIDS investigative team, which also featured such luminaries as Colm Kelleher, who co-wrote the first book on Skinwalker Ranch with George Knapp. Another UFO personality, who amongst others has the uncanny ability to crop up absolutely everywhere that intelligence agencies are conducting misinformation campaigns. 
a man who is undeniably entwined with pushing UFO narratives behind the scenes, both as an investigative journalist who manages to forget how to practice journalism whenever he covers the subject of UFOs, he is also most assuredly the reason his friend and podcast co-host Jeremy Corbell is able to get his hands on unimpressive but genuinely classified leaks. Due to his murky intelligence connections, his historical proximity to the topic, and a distinct lack of journalistic rigour on the subject matter, is evidence enough to suggest that appearances are certainly not what they appear to be with this individual. Today, counterintelligence operatives with murky histories have interwoven themselves directly into the UFO community, and recently they began targeting STEM PhDs in the academic fields to help provide an air of authenticity to the topic. Eric Weinstein was a target of this operation, but has thus far not taken the bait, and recently publicly condemned it for potentially attempting to recruit him in a disinformation campaign. Another academic is Sam Harris, an extremely popular philosopher and neuroscientist, who has the same story as Weinstein, who also refused the bait. And then there is Professor Gary Nolan of Stanford University, who freely admits that the CIA came to his office in Stanford and asked him to start looking into the subject of UFOs. Stan Professor, an immunologist doing medical research and building mm -hmm. companies, and all of a sudden one day the CIA shows up at your office? Right, right. right. No, of course, I mean, I, like I, I said, I mean, at first I thought it was a joke. I mean, I really thought that I was being, somebody was about to put me on candid camera and make a joke of it. And has since become an advocate for it to such an extent that he was recently recruiting investors at a tech summit, making the extraordinary claim that he was weeks away from being shown actual UFO wreckage by the government. I mean, I could say this, I, I was working with a group about seven, eight years ago, and I literally got within a few weeks of gaining access to one of the, um, one of the objects. And when the people who didn't want us to gain access to it found out about it, they pulled some bureaucratic administrative tricks and snatched it away. Again, does this sound familiar? Academics are being quietly recruited in private by people directly connected to the intelligence sector, quite possibly by Hal Puthoff himself, if history is any precedent. And they are all being asked to use their expertise to lend credibility to the subject of UFOs, or as they have recently been rebranded, UAPs. However, very few academics have taken the bait because upon cursory inspection, there is absolutely no there there, and no evidence to ever support there ever having been a there there to begin with. Enter a man named Travis Taylor, a TV personality currently the lead in a reality TV entertainment program titled The Secrets of Skinwalker Ranch, which may just be the single best example anywhere of how science should not be conducted. It was recently revealed to have direct ties to a secret Pentagon effort to investigate UFOs but in reality, is bested in virtual real-time by a video game designer named Mick West, along with Travis Taylor's Pentagon efforts, which failed to identify virtually anything that required critical thinking. Be it misidentified stars, balloons, you name it, they fail to identify it. To such an extent that they even fail to understand how to use basic star charts. These are not the caliber of people who are going to bring UFO disclosure to the masses, but they are individuals who are happy to enjoy the lucrative benefits that the UFO community provides them, with the convention circuit and residuals from a show that is as popular as it is downright stupid. Then there is David Fravor, a fighter pilot with an extraordinary and compelling tale, who doesn't seem to be able to keep the details of his story straight, along with co-pilots and other planes involved in the alleged Nimitz incident at the time of his encounter, and none of them even once fought to operate any of the sophisticated camera systems in their planes to actually document what may have been one of the most extraordinary encounters in the history of the planet. Not one of them. Wouldn't you want to take a picture of that? Does nobody believe that it wouldn't have been protocol to take visual evidence of this encounter? It's a compelling story, but it doesn't make any sense. The footage leaked of this incident by Lou Elizondo and Christopher Mellon via the New York Times is actually of a different encounter with a different pilot later that same day looking for the same alleged craft. The footage provided of this particular incident is once again grainy 
and unimpressive and proof of absolutely nothing out of the ordinary. Meanwhile, Fravor & Co became embraced by the UFO community. His story was compelling and he sure seems like a believable witness. But upon closer inspection, the story just doesn't hold up to scrutiny and discrepancies between all of the pilots allegedly involved further dampens any authenticity. Not to mention that David Fravor went on a podcast tour that culminated in a UFO parade, riding around in an open top car with none other than Jeremy Corbell and Bob Lazar, which isn't a great look if your credibility is on the line. My name is Lou Elizondo, and as a career intelligence officer, I am accustomed to being involved in close hold nuanced programs involving national security. Lou Elizondo, another counterintelligence operative who loves to do the podcast circuit. I'm not a UFO guy, I'm not a ufologist. I never have been, I never will be. I'm a counterterrorism and counterespionage guy. I just do counterintelligence, counterinsurgencies. That's what I do. And it just so happens that in 2008, I was asked to apply those same skill sets into the UFO community. Who, out of the kindness of his own heart, left the government and decided to dedicate his life to UFO disclosure and monetizing the subculture. The problem is, He's a professional liar. All counterintelligence agents are. It's what they do. And they are trained to do it convincingly. They will look you directly in the eye and smile at you with sincerity as they lie to your face. And in fairness, it is their job. But unfortunately, for those unsuspecting people caught in the crossfire, they effectively derail people's lives. Over the last decade, UFOs were systematically rebranded as UAPs by officials trying to distance themselves from the historic stigma of the subject. And Lou Elizondo was at the forefront of spearheading that campaign, most assuredly in preparation for a political campaign that never actually materialized, but was having the groundwork systematically laid for it by the likes of John Podesta for Hillary Clinton, who learned from her husband's alleged public interest in the subject in the 90s when he requested Roswell be investigated, only to discover nothing of note. Hillary Clinton promised on numerous talk shows to once again reopen the books when she gained office. I asked him about UFOs in Area 51, and, and if, he, if he looked in, because if I was president, that's the first thing I do. I go right into those files and right. see what was going on. Right. And he said that he did do that. Yes. And that he didn't find anything. Well, I'm oh. gonna... I'm gonna... <laughs> I'm gonna do it again. Only for it to end as predictably as you may expect, with quiet whispers of discontent from intel agencies, poised to capitalize on it as a springboard for a new campaign of political distraction. This is most likely why in 2017, during a hostile administration to the intelligence sector, they took the narrative into their own hands, which really reached its zenith during the pandemic in 2020 when imprisoned eyes around the world during lockdown with nothing better to do were inundated from officials and dubious journalists all promising UFO disclosure that never came to pass, but was nothing more than a highly convenient and welcome distraction from the horrors that most people were facing during that period. Christopher Mellon, another official with deep historical connections to the intelligence world, who along with Lou Elizondo helped leak the free nondescript grainy UFO videos disseminated via the New York Times' Leslie Keane, another dubious UFO advocate masquerading as a journalist. These videos have been prominently featured in practically every news article and UFO documentary since, including this one, and they are themselves deeply controversial. Once again, it's not the videos themselves that are compelling, but the stories that accompany them. But the problem is, it's no longer 1973, and grainy UFO videos that are cut short to obscure whatever it is that's actually being misrepresented simply aren't good enough. John B. Alexander, reportedly one of the aviary's lead instigators, codenamed Penguin, a man so enshrouded in the paranormal in official capacity that he was immortalized in the 2009 film The Men Who Stare at Goats, based on the book of the same name by John Ronson, chronicling the government's kooky experiments trying to create MK-Ultra-like psychic mind assassins. John Alexander, along with other counterintelligence operatives like Richard Doty, Hal Puthoff, Lou Elizondo and Christopher Mellon, took control of the UFO topic and began contacting researchers spreading fictional tales of UFOs and alien contact. 
Alexander appears in countless UFO documentaries and is not shy about his alleged interest in the paranormal. His proximity to all of the deception and cornerstones of UFO mythology, which they themselves created, along with Doty and Putoff, is truly on a staggering industrial scale. In the case of John B. Alexander, this is a man who somehow managed to find himself entwined with virtually every aspect of the paranormal. Psychics, remote viewing, UFOs, demonology, ghosts, Bigfoot, werewolves, and even Skinwalker Ranch. You name it. If it's weird, he's already been there and helped shape the narrative before you even heard about it. And Alexander, along with the rest of the so-called aviary, we're all doing this at the taxpayer's expense. There is an indisputable pattern, and it involves teasing the public with fantastic tales, innocuous evidence, and using the interest to generate official funding via taxpayers, or alternatively, to siphon private profit out of the sheer interest that the public has in topics which fascinate on a human level. Why is this even happening? The answer to this is probably very simple. It deflects attention from domestic defense network inadequacies, shields the military and private aerospace sectors, sows discord and disorientates adversaries. And it's also lucrative, very lucrative. There is no downside, except for having to proliferate extraordinary lies. And those who do so are held upon pedestals and promoted as heroes, even if their personal behavior in the specific case of Luella Zondo, shows anything but heroic efforts. In his specific case, he's been caught lying and using alternate social media accounts to intimidate and harass people who threaten his narrative, and actively attempted character assassinations of those asking valid questions of his extraordinary claims. The best form of defense is attack, especially those asking pertinent questions. Again, this is straight out of the aviary playbook which is actually counterintelligence training that taxpayers funded through the government. Promoting the belief in UFOs also helped shape popular culture to such an extent that when somebody sees something that operates in the sky that they can't immediately identify, they don't think of it as classified Lockheed Martin projects. Most people just see a UFO. Classified black projects operate for decades in total secrecy. The stealth bomber was also at one point classified and was responsible for untold amounts of UFO sightings, and it was operational and in active duty in the early 1970s, but only officially disclosed in 1990. Coincidentally, in the same time frame that Bob Lazar and the aviary were making all kinds of extraordinary claims throughout UFO culture, changing the landscape into a more approximate resemblance of what it appears as today. For anyone who lived during the 1990s and had an interest in UFOs, then you'll understand just how popular it became. The X-Files quickly followed Bob Lazar's stories. Independence Day released a few years later, along with Fire in the Sky and Men in Black derived from another popular UFO myth soon followed those. If you lived in the 1990s, you couldn't turn on a TV without seeing sensational documentaries on the topic. The alien autopsy hoax was born of this period. So too was the mythical Chuck Clark UFO tape alleged to be the greatest UFO video ever filmed. Never to be screened publicly, but that may probably change in the coming years, due to the unethical behavior of both Logan Paul and James Fox. This too was almost certainly another hoax which was intended to become a cultural phenomenon during that period, but was instead hoarded away by Clark himself for reasons which only he understands. Chuck Clark was a former resident of Rachel, Nevada, he would routinely dig up illegal surveillance equipment on public land, operated by the nearby base known as Area 51, and was himself heavily involved in ufology and promoted around the world at the height of Area 51 infamy. Chuck Clark may well have been involved in the production of this mythical UFO tape. One day we may find out, but the odds are we probably won't like what we find if we do. Imagine for a second, a hypothetical legacy program, but not an official program to reverse engineer UFOs and keep them a closely guarded secret, 
but instead an informal patriotic legacy program for people in different aspects of the military, intelligence agencies and the aerospace sector to continue to serve their country by systematically weaving lies into the counterculture, to maintain strategic tactical advantage over adversaries and to have fun and to earn a lot of money in the process. My name is Floyd Bushman. I'm a senior scientist from Lockheed Martin. Bizarre deathbed confessions of aliens and UFOs from officials intimately involved with the likes of Lockheed Martin and the aerospace sector that are later proven to be outright lies start to make far more sense when you think about it from a tactical vantage point of a counterintelligence operative. This isn't just being done to confuse you, but to confuse their counterparts in adversarial nations. Now to be clear, this isn't a proclamation that every prominent UFO advocate is a counterintelligence agent. No. What I am saying is that there is an awful lot of counterintelligence agents in the UFO community. They have a history of targeting energetic and enthusiastic believers in the subject, co-opting them sometimes knowingly or unwittingly, and using them as vessels to proliferate convenient propaganda and to siphon money for themselves. Everybody wins, except for the people who absorb their warped new reality and believe their lies. There is an extensive history of deception and lies used as a shield for the aerospace sector. Defense infrastructure inadequacies, adversarial incursions, the military industrial complex, intelligence networks for strategic tactical advantage, and government officials who use it during times of socio-economic downturn. Most people interested in UFOs are simply fascinated by the topic and the stories, and search for answers to escape their mundane lives. But the problem is, that fiction is being presented as a fact and many people derail their lives pursuing it and some break with reality entirely even if they're not being purposely pushed to breaking point by their own government like Paul Benowitz the end result is exactly the same now this doesn't mean that you shouldn't be fascinated by the topic its very premise speaks to many people on a primordial level you should be free to believe whatever you wish and not be mocked for being interested in it but you should demand evidence of extraordinary claims and again understand that people lie for reasons that make no rational sense. People enjoy attention and especially those who claim they don't want any. People like to feel special, finding meaning and companionship in their lives and dedicate themselves to something they see as far bigger than themselves. And these are the very human traits used to exploit us. Today, those most closely associated with intelligence operatives are those most popular for propagating UFO narratives in the mainstream. They have access to anonymous whistleblowers, which always turn out to be counterintelligence operatives, pushing low-level classified intelligence, and they are all undeniably interconnected through historical proximity, and are always present during key events in UFO mythology. This just isn't possible by chance. We have spacecraft from another species. We do, yeah. Each re-emerging with new insights and anonymous sources, brief snippets of edited low-resolution misrepresented videos that lack context, but that are accompanied with extraordinarily enthusiastic stories that expand upon the perpetual UFO mythology, but no evidence. I never wanted to be on national TV, <laughs> no offense. And no evidence at all to support anything ever being alien. Neither is there any evidence of any data whatsoever supporting any craft actually defying the laws of physics. The convenient rebranding of UFOs to UAP in official terminology was simply to disassociate from the murky historic stigma of the subject. If you want evidence, there is all the evidence in the world to support key mythology in the UFO subject being an ongoing partially orchestrated historical counterintelligence operation to propagate convenient mythology and lay cover for any number of agencies and official sectors for any number of reasons. What began with the Holloman UFO landing footage and Paul Benowitz in the 1970s slowly evolved over the decades into a broader public operation in a warped bubble of reality, even seemingly blindsiding officials from the establishment with its newfound urgency for public funding. President Obama says that there is footage and uh, records of objects in the skies, these unidentified aerial phenomenon 
And he says, we don't know exactly what they are. What do you think that it is? I would ask him again. Thank you. <laughs> there are numerous intelligence and military officials intimately involved in the paranormal. But the consistent operators in these numerous kooky fields, parapsychology, remote viewing, UFOs, ghosts, and even demonology, are where we should be looking. As to who was then, and who now holds the keys to the legacy of the aviary. John Alexander, Hal Puthoff, Richard Doty are consistent in their respective operations, but these agents became, if only inadvertently, an offbeat public face to various cornerstones of fabricated paranormal mythology. However, the person most intimately entwined in these various fields, hiding behind those lurking in the shadows, playing people off each other, and helping shape the cultural landscape, was a man named Cecil B. Scott Jones. For all intensive purposes, this man was the aviary. Born February 19th, 1928, passed away January 16th, 2023. Meticulous at keeping himself out of the limelight during the time of his most active operations, but always present and a guiding hand in shaping key events in UFO culture, amongst many other high strangeness operations. He was key to the 1988 UFO cover-up live broadcast coming to fruition, and actively brought players from the intelligence world into the UFO community to play various roles by donning mysterious pseudonyms. The CIA was well aware of this, and celebrated it. It's playfully alluded to in an extremely odd CIA document, affectionately titled, Would the Real C.B. Scott Jones Please Stand Up? A bizarre 24-page monogram declassified in 2003, listing Cecil B. Scott Jones' association with key paranormal communities, how he was best situated for his elusive role and his close proximity to all paranormal fields and the key players associated with them. And this was required for intelligence operatives to effectively operate and propagate their lies amongst them. This is the man who helped shape it all for decades. And the chances are, you've never even heard his name. This is, of course, not by accident. Once retired, however, he didn't exactly shy away from it either. Like Doty, Putoff, and Alexander, he wholeheartedly embraced it. The late Congressman Harry Reid has also been intimately involved in propagating UFOs in the political world, using his intelligence connections with all of the aforementioned individuals. The question is, why haven't most of you heard about this? They no longer call themselves the aviary. That was itself a clever nod to a far larger program being conducted by the CIA at the time, known as Operation Mockingbird, the systematic infiltration, co-opting and consolidation of mainstream media by intelligence operatives. But today, decades later, who's really behind the curtain of the modern aviary? Well, in my opinion, and that's all this should be taken as, an informed speculative opinion, there are several candidates responsible for propagating this behind the scenes today. Those who quietly take ears of prominent politicians, officials and media personalities in an attempt to try and convince them of things that they know full well aren't real. Quite possibly the very same people who took aside Gary Nolan, tried to co-op Sam Harris and Eric Weinstein, and who also likely steered Lou Elizondo into a sudden career departure and life dedicated to ufology who are continually present and the active participants for all of the cornerstones of modern UFO mythology. The two best candidates for the leadership today are Hal Putoff and Christopher Mellon. It doesn't really matter which. Both are involved behind the scenes. Ultimately, all of them are working towards the same goal for officials who sit behind desks at the CIA. However, whoever is pulling the strings today using counterintelligence operatives in ufology as both a privately profitable, politically expedient and convenient smokescreen for various sectors, to confuse minds, derail lives and send people down a rabbit hole that has no end? We may never even know their name. And to be perfectly honest, we don't need to know who. Just that what they're peddling amounts to nothing more 
than lies. The aviary aren't mythical insiders guarding secret alien technology. They are professionally trained liars. Take a good look around at the UFO community. There sure is a lot of counterintelligence operating in it. And today, they don't use pseudonyms of birds. They're right out in the open and use their own names to add even more plausibility to their professional lies. And many of them do this right alongside the original members of the aviary in documentaries, podcasts, all over social media, and much like yesterday, today, they all claim their own extraordinary stories, backed up by nothing more than their own sincerity, using their own connections to the official world as a seal of authenticity that ignites the minds of those seeking answers. The aviary never stopped trying to influence popular UFO culture. It simply changed the way it operates. It slowly became UFO culture. They want you to believe. Please like, subscribe and comment and share if you enjoyed my work. It truly helps more people find this content with the algorithm and will hopefully help this new channel grow. And you can also support my work on Patreon. It would be much appreciated. Our group is euphemistically called the Aviary. And each individual uses the code name of a bird as an identifier. We will continue to provide the UFO community with data and we will continue to proceed in a way which we feel best suits our purposes. If you thought UFOs were weird, just wait until you see what's coming next.